Welcome to another episode of Tech Done Different. I'm your host, Ted Harrington, and joining me today is my very, very, very dear friend and fellow author, Ron Thurston. Ron, thank you so much for joining the show here. Thanks, Ted. I'm so happy to spend some time with you. Me too, my friend. Now, Ron is not going to brag about himself, so I will do it for him. Uh, Ron is the number one best-selling author of Retail Pride, which just came out was it October 10th or something? October 13th. October 13th. Yeah. So it took you about about a year from when you started writing it until you you published it. And then it was like 24 hours or something. You hit 20, yeah. hit number one. I did. As did you. But yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you are, Ron is a, well, I'm talking to you, Ron. So, but also for the audience's sake, Ron is a, uh, a retail leader. He's He's worked across a number of um, really high profile brands that many of us shop at. And and Ron, your book is, it's about retail, but there's so much in this book. Like I've been live tweeting you as I've been reading it. There's so much in this book that actually directly applies to our audience here in technology and in security. And so maybe you could just sort of give the, the you know, 20 second background of sort of your leadership background and, and the kind of roles that you've been in and um, we can then dig into some of the questions I have about it. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, and so the subtitle of the book is Retail Pride, the Guide to Celebrating Your Accidental Career. And this is, you know, for, for many people, often their careers are accidents. But in retail, it's actually very common because there's not one particular degree that you have that makes you successful. There's not one particular study or school or company that retail success as a as a retail leader, and I use retail in a very broad sense because it covers everything from grocery, pharmacy, clothing, like tech. It, it covers in a very broad way. But the this idea that you can create your own path and you can be celebrated for it was a really important message. And so as I have grown my own career, so I, I grew up in Northern California, and my grandfather built um, some of the like early um, grocery stores, um, custom homes, schools um, of South Lake Tahoe. And it was really like kind of a, a great way to watch someone start small. And when I was a small child and he was building this company that became the primary construction firm for building all the Safeway stores on the West Coast. And I would travel with him as much as I could and watch him lead. And what he did so well was he was highly curious, highly empathetic, um, and very focused to get the job done. And when I thought about this book, those are really pillars of great leadership. And so that, while that, I do say they apply to retail, but it really applies to everything that we do as leaders, is that we are highly empathetic. Um, and particularly this year, and as someone that that runs a large company, uh, my empathy is on high every day. Um, and also, you know, highly curious, what is the customer saying? What do they need? What does your team need? What, how is the product evolving? Um, and then focus to deliver the best results possible um, in a time where it's incredibly challenged to do so. Um, but um, I kind of started on the retail side, studied fashion design. Um, and did that for a few years, but then translated into retail and started at, actually at The Gap uh, and spent about 11 years there starting in, in sales um, to assistant manager, store manager, and grew my, my career and became um, a director running about 450 stores for them uh, and have continued to work for great brands. Um, I helped start West Elm. I ran Apple stores. Um, i Worked for Tori Birch early on and helped her launch all the stores on the West Coast. Uh, I moved here to New York about six years ago to help launch Bonobos, which is a men's brand that I think probably a lot of your listeners um, maybe know and love. So that I launched the retail concept for um, what is what they call the guide shop, um, and had the pleasure of running um, Saint Laurent, which is one of the most kind of important luxury brands in the world with such a beautiful history. Um, and then today running Intermix, which is uh, a, a 
division of Gap Inc. So I've come back around to the, the company where I started to run one of the smaller divisions. Uh, and I've had a kind of a 30 year, um, that, that's all the, what I just described is over the course of about 30 years, but it's been a pleasure and I love it more every day. Yeah, man. One of the things that I've, I've always admired about you is you, you really lead with love and you're very, um, the real Ron is sort of always, always coming through and you can see that as just a leadership principle. And one of the things that you talked about when you're just introducing yourself was this idea of, of results, especially in trying times, which, which we're in right now. And in a sense, the, those of us that are in technology and in security were, we're kind of lucky in that for many of us, the transition to work from home was easier than for other organizations. We certainly didn't, um, many of us see our companies shut down, especially people in security actually saw the opposite happening where it's like the level of intensity went up, but nevertheless, it's been, been really challenging times and, um, hitting results has been difficult for a lot of individuals, a lot of organizations. And you have this concept that you talk about in your book where you talk about, you call it going green. And it really struck me because it was essentially a way to, and I'll ask you to describe it. You're going to do it better than I do, but uh, as, a, as a way to sort of set your goal. And if you're hitting your goal, you're going green. And if you're close, you're yellow. And if you're way off base, you're red and what to do about that. So I think this is, this is the definition of kind of what this show is about. Like, how do we think differently about things? And I really like this model. So maybe could you talk about what it is going green? I'd love to. So it really, it started probably 20 years ago when I really, and you can see on a sales flash, you know, you make an assumption that if you achieve your goal, whatever that is, that you're, you're green, that meaning, meaning go, you know, yellow, if you kind of just missed it and red is you missed it significantly. And so I continue to build this idea of celebrating the color green and celebrating the win, celebrating the money, celebrating this continued aspiration to hitting a particular color. And kind of the psychology behind that um, was much more powerful than I expected. And I have used this idea, I use it still today, of I want you to be able to go green. And what does that mean? It means that you have achieved the goal that you've set, whatever that looks like, whether it's financially, um, whether it's in customer service feedback, team feedback, that green means you've made your goal. Yellow means you've missed your goal by probably between you know, 0.1 and 10%. Red means you've missed your goal by more than 10%. And when you put that on a spreadsheet and you can sort it and you can share it, what happens is yellow, and I'll just use stores as a reference, yellow stores, then I'd say if you just did five more transactions, you did one more sale, you did X, Y, and Z, you'd get to green. And so it's easy to get someone from yellow to green. And so I would always celebrate, celebrate the win from yellow to green and count that down. And if you were red, I would say, let's get you to yellow. You may not be able to get to green, but let's get you to yellow. Let's find that out. So there's this constant like drive to move your place up. And this all sounds highly simple, but I will tell you that as kind of humans, we aspire to those very simple concepts and that, and, and as this momentum has grown, I mentioned just a few examples in the book, but I've been on store visits where they literally like a 3000 square foot stock room hung green dollar signs from the ceiling, all like a sea of stars of green dollar signs. I've, I've been on teams where everyone wore green t-shirts. I've been, I have a, a framed t-shirt in my office that says hashtag go green that someone actually created, everyone in the store wore it for a meeting, took pictures of it and sent me one for myself. Like this kind of idea of celebrating the win and celebrating kind of a common goal, um, but with a fun, um, kind of a fun twist. For me, it, it sounds simple, but it works. And it works in, in everything that you do. And yeah. you know, I, I have definitely been known as that, that guy that can make sales happen faster but in in a way that feels very authentic and organic and it isn't just about the sales flash i love the the concept i mean just purely as a leadership principle the concept of celebrating success for sure you want to do that and and i feel that a lot of leaders actually often do the opposite where they sort of 
highlight the like, don't do that. We don't want to do that bad thing. We want to stop that failure. And like, yeah, we do. And of course need to coach out bad things, but we want to spend more energy talking about where are we trying to go? What's the success? Who's doing it right? Who should we model after? And one, one aspect of what you described that I, that it's really interesting. It's hearing you describe it. It's more than just celebrating success. It's giving people rungs on the ladder which mm -hmm. it's not as binary as like, here's this huge goal and either you did it or you didn't. It's mm -hmm. where are you in pursuit of it and how do we get you to that next step? Yeah. Um, and it sounds yeah, like what you're was, saying is that that helps people really jump to that next rung. They jump because it doesn't feel as far. And so the, that, that step on the ladder, um, and when I've had large numbers of teams report into me and I've done the same concept, the bottom of the red, so if I, I say, if I had 120 stores, the top, the bottom 20, the darkest red of the bottom 20 would put them, I'd put them on a call and say like, I don't want you to be on this call next week. You need to be off this call and you need to be in closer to yellow than you are into red. And then you're like three weeks in, it's the same stores. I'm like, then, then we have a problem. So it, I also think that there's not just about celebrating the win, it's creating kind of accountability and, and digging in like, let's move you forward. Let's always find ways to move you forward. Um, and that um, has definitely has worked. Um, this year, there's a lot of red on everyone's. And sure. I'm, I'm kind of actually scaling back on it because if you send out a report and there's two stores that made their goal and there's 50 that didn't, that's not as motivating. So I'm celebrating different things. I'm celebrating customer service feedback. I'm celebrating how we treat each other. I'm celebrating um your contributions to product feedback like just things that may not be as financial but don't don't change your culture of winning because the sales aren't there because that's that can be very demoralizing for a team over yeah, time no doubt. yeah yeah that's the difficulty in setting setting goals right is uh if they're too big they're not incentivizing. The perfect goal is something that's difficult but achievable. It's like I can do it if I just work a little bit harder but not so easy that I can do it without trying and not so hard that it's impossible. And that's a difficult task. So maybe this year is um, a bit of an outlier because the world sort of collapsed around us and especially in retail. I mean, wow, did you guys get hit hard with it? So, but let's take maybe that exception out of it. How do you go about, it sounds like you've, you've figured out how to do that, how to set um, difficult but attainable goals. What's your process? What's your framework? How do you actually go about doing that? So it's, it's looking at all the different financial components of, with a realistic thought process. So if you say, we expect 40% less people to come through the door. Okay. Like, let's just put that as a baseline. And the average person then spends X amount of dollars. How many more do you need to convert more walk-in traffic into a sale? Does that sale then need to be a larger sale than it was? So what has happened this year is um, the challenge in retail is that the traffic is down and the average spend is down. People are being much more fiscally responsible this year and they have less events to go. They're not traveling. And so this idea of, okay, there's going to be less traffic. She's actually going to spend less money. Therefore, we need to sell more units and we need to sell those units at full price, um, not at a markdown. So we're, we're making actually the most amount of money possible on a, a sale that is less dollars but higher in margin and on less traffic so the, there's there's all different ways to look at it i think the other thing that happened this year <clears throat> is that it's in in retail business is that it's not one size fits all but there are parts of the country that are booming um depending on where the money is and so i have stores in cities like miami aspen marin greenwich westport that are booming, they're well above last year. And we're actually trying to funnel the most expensive product possible to those stores because that, that's where the money went. West Palm Beach, I have a store on Worth Avenue in Palm Beach that's doing triple what it did a year ago. And so that, that's where the money is. And so you have to say, she's not in New York City, she's actually in the Hamptons. And the Hamptons, same, doing well above last year. So there's this whole shift of it's not one size fits all, that there are teams that are need to be celebrated for something that may not be as financial, but stores 
like a Palm Beach, then actually need to talk about going green and need to then get more inventory and fuel where you can make it happen. And that's the other part of digging in is that it's there's not one particular answer to the to the test today. And that has put all of us um, definitely on high alert. Oh man, if, if there was one answer to any of these tests, these leadership tests, I, how do I get that cheat sheet? I want that. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> so you have, uh, there's a few things you talk about in the book that literally made me exclaim out loud. Um, <laughs> and you know what these are because I circled them in red, dog eared the page and texted you and, and was like, dude, I just sent this to my team. This is amazing. Um, <laughs> And so I want to talk about some of these ideas because, first of all, I think you and I have similar axes to grind, um, <laughs> and 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 I also think fundamentally these are the some of the core ideas for uh, success and how someone can develop their career. So uh, we can talk through a few of them. So some of the ones right. you mentioned, um, I'm looking at your book here. We talk about you know number one, show up on time. Number two, take control of your own career development. Number three, manage your time. Number four, demonstrate great attention to detail. And number five, make other people look good. Mm -hmm. So let's, I mean, let's talk about those. Which which of those do you want to talk about first? Because I want to talk about all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I I am, I put it as a pillar of, of leadership is make everyone else look good, make everyone else look important. But this is not about you. And that kind of selfless leadership um, is surprisingly not always available, but that is your role as a leader is to make everyone else look great. And it doesn't mean that I, that I approach that situation that's difficult by not understanding what the problem is. What I do is say, let's address this problem. So maybe it is attendance and let's solve it, but then let's figure out what you're actually good at so that we can make you look good. And that is a very powerful message to someone that's struggling or someone that feels lost or someone that doesn't feel like they've made great choices in their career. And, you know, the power that we have as leaders can be um, sometimes forgotten. And I've been even like, I would say, emotionally very surprised by people who have reached out since the book. And, and have said things like, you know, I worked for you 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I found your book and it's like spending time with you again. And I really oh. appreciate it. Like those kinds of, um, that idea of you, we as leaders do leave an impact and you actually don't even know that. You don't know that you, I left the store. I'll, I'll, I have stores that I only visit once a year and they'll say to me, well, last year when you were here, you said this and you didn't like this and you, and I was like, okay, like I, I don't remember that, but let's talk about today. And so that idea of they, they felt very important because not because I was there, but because I wanted to celebrate what they were doing really well. And every situation you can do that. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, let, let's talk about how we can celebrate and, and make people look good. I mean, I'm I'm like you in that I set goals and and try to do ridiculously hard things. I mean, we both sat down and we're like, let's not just write a book, let's write it like in a year and let's make it, let's make it a bestseller. Like it's just what what other elements can we add to it? And I, you know, when I think about my own leadership philosophy, I don't just want to be a good leader. I want to be like the best leader the people I lead have ever worked with. Like that's that's my goal and I mean, first of all, it's difficult to measure and it's almost an impossible goal. It's so big, yeah. but that's what to me makes it inspiring is if you can think about like, well, how would you measure that? You'd measure that if 25 years later, someone were to come up to me and say, you might not even remember this, but you impacted me in this way. And so it sounds like you're already achieving um, that huge, huge lofty goal. So maybe you could talk about a specific example or a few examples of how you might celebrate someone uh, in order to make them look good. And, and maybe even in a case where it was actually you <laughs> who did <Yeah>. it and <laughs> deferred the credit. Uh, gosh, I think even part of even 
you know, I, I work in a very client centric business. And so if you, as do, I think many people in, in your industry, you're serving a client. So my client often is, is a woman who is and loves fashion, loves to be styled, um, has great, um, kind of a, a great joy in looking great all the time. And so when I, if I am in a store um, and I want to, and clients come in, you know, that they, they're very complimentary of the team, but I put all of, and, and the product and the store and the culture and the people, they're very complimentary. Um, but I put all of that back on, on the store and say, thank you, but this is, you know, this is your stylist. This is who's um, helping you achieve those goals and give the credit to everyone else that's there. And I don't take any of it. I don't say, well, you know, I'm glad you think the company's well led, but I want to give all of the power to the people that work in the store. And that um, is, is kind of a shift, you know, to could be example. And then, you know, I've had such great joy and then being able to um, give experiences to the sales teams that maybe I would have taken myself like going to fashion shows during fashion week or like give away those tickets, let them take their client when really I should go, but like let the sales salesperson go. Salesperson would never have the opportunity to do that. Um, and some, you know, having uh, run Saint Laurent, and I, these were all in Paris. So like take a client to Paris, I'm sending you to Paris with your client. It's all like very first class, you sit front row, you know, by the way, that client will probably spend a quarter of a million dollars that, that day. But that's, that, that's not the point. The point is that everyone had a really incredible experience. And I was able to just kind of facilitate that happening to where whatever that looks like for your business, like find those opportunities to give away things that you may have been able to take for yourself. Yeah. Ron, if you're looking for people to send to Fashion Week, on a, with you um how, where's the sign up how do i get to do that <laughs> oh, that's funny. i mean ben's fashion week's pretty much over at this point i think it it, it tried to come and now it, it's not happening anymore yeah. but there's just not enough of you around <laughs> i know well one thing that's interesting about what you're talking about is and I'll, let me state this as a statement and then you tell me if you agree or disagree or where the holes are in this um it seems to me that this idea of really deferring credit and even deferring perks like what you're talking about and uh, you know, making sure that everyone around you who's involved with it is getting credit, it feels to me like those principles wind up being self-fulfilling, right? So even if at first it's like, well, maybe the leader really did do all the work, but the more that the praise is spread, then everyone else starts to build their confidence and then the results actually wind up being because of everybody else. Do you think yeah. that that is true or false or how should that idea be improved? I think it's a hundred percent true. And I have been on the reason I'm so passionate about this topic, I will say, and which is not in the book is because when I was on this running stores um, on and people who are in roles like I have today and would come to the store and say hello to the store manager and take them out to lunch and then come back and wave goodbye and didn't actually speak to anyone. Or, you know, we spent a week getting the store. I'm just reference gap. Like some of those big denim walls take a week to get folded, to look like they do sometimes a week of overnights. So we would spend a week folding this like to perfection and, and would get no, no attention. And I'm not saying that in a trying to bash someone way, but, I remember how that felt and to be lower, um, to be someone who didn't deserve attention. And I today have that feeling and I go out of my way to make sure that I say hello to everyone. That if I can say, you know what, let's all just go downstairs and sit around and you know, shoot the shit for 30 minutes so I can just you can get to know me and I can get to know you and you can tell me what you love and hate about working here. Let's do it. And I will tell you that those moments are sometimes 
some of the most powerful because they they like, oh, I get to sit and, and spend time, you know, with the leader of the company. And yeah, I don't know how common that is in, in your world. It's not as common in mine. Yeah. No, it's crazy. I mean, what you're talking about is so simple and yet so powerful. It's and I'm just I don't know if words in your mouth, but it sounds like you're saying just talk to people, like talk to the every every level, uh, and good things come out of that. It's it sounds simple, but it's not. It's not well done. It's not a common practice. Yeah, and it, it's a little. Um, you know, I, I do write about it a little bit in the book as a as a prompt of like I want I want other people to do this. Um, everyone's valuable. Every role in, in a business is valuable. Yeah. And that's yeah, why I, I love like this. those. Go ahead. No, keep going. Keep going. I was, you know, I love those, those stories of like or commercials you see about McDonald's, you know, that are well-run McDonald's celebrate those, those roles that, as if they are the most important person in that store. And they're certainly not making more than minimum wage. And they go home, you know, smelling your French fries every day, but they, you can tell that they have a great boss or, you know, I was in, interacting with someone on LinkedIn that runs Dollar General stores. So if you think about Dollar General, you know, it doesn't have the greatest reputation. You can imagine the hard work that it takes during the holiday season to work in Dollar General mm -hmm. and the, the customers, you know, that they engage with all of, all of it. And she posted on LinkedIn the top 10, her 10 stores, stock rooms of their wall of, of gratitude. And she wanted people on LinkedIn to vote for her 10 stores and their walls of gratitude in the Dollar General store. I was like, wow. you are a rock star. That is, you are, it's the ultimate expression of retail pride. Like you don't, you are so proud to work at Dollar General that you're asking your LinkedIn community to vote. Like that, that was really important to me to see that happen because sometimes you work in luxury and we get all the glamour and it's actually, it doesn't like pride in what you do and how you lead shouldn't be dictated by price. And if you sell something that costs a dollar and I sell something that costs a thousand dollars, we lead in the same way. Totally. And that's really important. Even across industry lines. I mean, every, a lot of what I'm hearing you say, carries over into technology. These principles are, are universal in a lot of ways. And, you know, you might sell a physical item that someone walks into a store to buy and people listening to this might sell software that someone pays a subscription to, but they, they're still, right? It's still leadership principles about how to help, you know, get the most out of people. And um, yeah, I think just that they, they seem universal and timeless. I'm trying to think in my mind, like, what's the equivalent of the stock room that we can take a picture of in order to say like, Hey, let's bring the LinkedIn community into celebrating people. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. All, all of it. And that's you know, link, LinkedIn is, is the power of, of retail is built in there. And you know, you, you and I are super active on there, but it's because you need to see yourself. You, the, the reaction, the reason why the book has been so well received by the industry is because no one has ever said thank you. Hmm. No one has ever said, I'm proud of what you do. And this is a really great career. No, and I should say there's never been a book that did that. They may have had a leader that did that. And I really hope that they did. But if, if you are the number, as the industry, one of the biggest employers in the country, and there's not a single book on the market that says thank you, like that, that is why I wrote this book. Because that's what that is our job as leaders is to just say thank you. Oh man, I love that. That's amazing. You know, one of the things that I put in my book was along the same line of saying thank you because I feel that so many security professionals in particular really do a thankless job. And maybe it's not to the same extreme as what uh, people in retail face, because that those are definitely some real challenges that you mentioned. But it does seem to me like security whoever's in charge of security for something their their job is often measured as you didn't get hacked yet <laughs> it's like thanks for not a bad thing happening yet like I, that just doesn't feel good for anybody and so i i totally hear you and I, I explicitly wrote in my book like this idea of for those of you working in a thankless often thankless job you know, yeah. let me be the first to say thank you 
And I love this idea of gratitude that you're, you're talking about. Um, there's actually other guests that we've talked to who have echoed similar things. It seems like once you establish a leadership position, it's like, oh, gratitude is a good thing. We're, yeah, we're recognizing exactly. that now. Regardless of what you sell, it doesn't matter anymore. Totally. Yeah. What are some ways that you practice gratitude or teach gratitude or see it play out? Uh, you know, so in, in lieu of traveling, you know, I've not really been on a plane much this year. Um, I'm doing a lot of Zoom calls in stores. And so while emails are great or contests are fun um, and gift card prizes are, can, can make someone's day, I actually think it needs to be done live. Uh, and so I do also, uh, I do a lot of all hands calls um, at least once a month. I have one tomorrow that is just kind of year end celebration. So that you can put, you know, a couple hundred people on Zoom and be able to say it live or to do like a, a virtual store visit, which I've been doing a lot of those. Like, let's get that team together. Let's walk through your store. Let's talk about your business. Let's talk about your product. Let's do all of it, but let's do it on Zoom. Because if I can't come to you in person, I'm going to come to you virtually. Um, and nothing, nothing replaces that. Um, and I, and I do um, every store every night sends like a recap of their business. And I do reply to those emails, but it's not the same um, as just a great conversation with kind of listen, listening with empathy and being curious again about their business and and celebrating the small wins because the wins are not financial today. And you don't understand that if you don't speak to them because it doesn't come through in your email. All you say is, wow, it was like, I missed my day by 50%. But, but I had this, this level of engagement with customers that was so powerful that's not gonna show up on paper. So you, th you say thank you for the things that, that don't show up on the sales flash. Love it. Yeah. So as we wrap up, let's talk about this part in your book where you explicitly described this podcast. <laughs> you, you didn't know it, but you were describing this podcast, or at least that's the way I read it. And that's maybe I have an issue there that I'm like, oh, well, Ron's obviously talking directly to and about me right now. <laughs> it may you, have been. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't put it past you. you. Like I said, you lead with love. You, you would be like, yeah, I'll write about Ted's podcast in this book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you you mentioned these three ideas, which I have circled and dog-eared this page as well. You said you were talking about how to build a winning culture. And you said we have to, number one, think differently. We have to, number two, act differently. And number three, we have to become better. I mean, that is like, that's what the show is about. That's what security is about. That's what I think the people who build the best software systems, they all believe those things. So tell me about your beliefs around these three ideas and, and um, you know, how people should think about them. So I, I would reference, I mean, my own leadership, but I would say as, an, as, an, as a retail industry, and this has nothing to do with COVID, that as, as the way we live our lives has evolved, thinking differently and acting differently is the only way we will survive. So the, the, those big pillar brands that have fallen in the last 10 years, and there are several that you can think about that are anchors and malls or, or really large specialty chains where like six, 700 stores all go out of business. It's from, they didn't think differently. They didn't act differently. And they didn't think about how to operate their business with the customer in mind. And so this constant idea of, great, I'm super, my flash looks super green. You know, I would even reference the last couple of years for me, best, best results the company has ever seen in 27 year history until March of 2020, best years ever. And, but I didn't ever miss the opportunity to say, well, how else can I be better? What else can we do differently? And not just kind of settle for what that. For, for what that looks like. So always thinking and acting differently. Um, and, and they may be small because I think even that concept feels really out of touch. But what's one thing you can do differently? What's one thing you can do um, that either is around self-development or around your business development? And maybe, yeah. maybe they are in tandem. 
Yeah, that's interesting the way you describe that in terms of uh, you're already on a win streak, don't settle. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see that sort of metaphorically play out all the time in sports where, you know, one one team might have the lead towards the end of the game. They start playing like a prevent defense, like let's just make the other team not score. We don't need to score more points. We'll just keep them from scoring. And that's that team loses that game every single time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the teams who constantly are gunning, like they want to, they want to run up the score. They want to, you know, not just win, but dominate. Those are the teams that do actually win and dominate. And I know you weren't describing it that like aggressive bro culture. That wasn't what you were getting at, but the idea of continuing to push, even when you're, you're ahead, that's really strong. And I was wondering if there are examples of, how that actually manifests itself in terms of like your leadership style that you might share. Hmm. I, what would I say? I think every, every book, every book opportunity that I've had to read something that is entirely not related to my business or about leadership, uh, like your book's a good example or the other people that have kind of published around us, friends of ours that have published, um, or many other books, every opportunity to share a concept that is not just about traditional business, um, I think is powerful. And so I, I will you, I'll share one example. So there's a woman um, who published through um, Lioncrest, as we did, who wrote a book about IVF. I, I, I'm a gay man. I know nothing about IVF. It's not, it's not in my sphere. But she, the reason I was introduced to her was because uh, she writes in her book about my brand and that about Intermix. She's a New York City woman who uh, used her toughest days when she was feeling her worst to go to Intermix to feel better and feel pretty and wow. to just try on clothes. And so there's an entire chapter in her book called Intermix. And so we have been, she lives now, she's in New Jersey in the suburbs with her kids, and we are now friends. And so this idea of taking these worlds that don't feel like they have anything in common when in fact they actually really do. That I shared that story on an all on an all-store call. And I and my message was this woman actually never bought anything. Yet she wrote about about the business and the experiences that she had with you and that were so powerful that you didn't even know it. And so we all have impact as leaders that we don't even know. And we all have impact on businesses that um, you don't recognize. So use those when they when they hit me, I really do try to say, well, why and what can I do differently? What can I do better? Um, how can I think differently to bring those conversations into it? Because it's really it's easy to get stuck in your own lane, totally, and in your own business. What a powerful way to wrap things up here! Because in so many ways, what you just talked about is why you, as a retail expert, are on a show <laughs> for technology and security professionals. It's because we want to get these. Uh, these insights from other places, you know, get outside of our echo chamber and, uh, and, and learn. And maybe in some cases, think of new ideas and in other cases, reinforce that, hey, that idea that we've been doing is in fact the right idea. And Ron, I think you've, uh, you've done that. And then, I mean, the value you just delivered to our community is unbelievable. And I, I can't thank you enough. Thank you, thank you Ted. And I, congratulations on your book. We spent zero time talking about yours. You know, but you know, it's it's a pleasure. <laughs> well, I understand that, but you know, I think you know, again, there's a group of people who I would never have read a book about ethical hacking. I would never have done it. Yeah, it's just not in my world. And so now you're reading mine, and I'm reading yours, and we're learning from each other. And don't don't ever forget the power that that has totally. for everyone. Yeah, and our respective LinkedIn communities are like, wait. Ron, why, why do you keep commenting on that that <laughs> hacker content? <laughs> I, do. I love that. I like to keep people on their toes. Like, but why is working. he like that? 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ron, thank you so much. Uh, if people want to learn more or get a hold of you, what should they do? Where should they go? Yeah. If you just go to retailpride.com, you can certainly find me on LinkedIn, but retailpride.com, you can sign up for future releases. I'm going to do um, start a program um, on in January called Saturday Mornings with Ron, um, where we're going to, I'm going to get as many people as possible on Zoom and do breakout rooms and live um, book sessions. And, you know, it's very common in retail to have like a morning meeting, a morning, like we call 15 minute meeting. I'm going to have a 15 minute meeting every week for as many people as I can get on the call um, that they can use for the week and, but also use it to introduce each other, some new connections, which are necessary today. Um, and so if you sign up at retailpride.com, you can learn more about that. Awesome. Yeah. Ron, you're the man. Thank you so much, my friend, for being here. I will probably text you 47 times later today about how much I appreciated it. <laughs> I, I hope so. I hope so. It was a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks for asking. All right, my friend. We'll talk right. to you later. Thanks, Ted. Mm -hmm.